Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Today's message is humanity. Now, here's Pastor Chris. Well, good morning, everybody. As you can tell from my voice, I've been singing bass the last couple days. I'm practicing my James Earl Jones impressions. So I'm going to try to keep it as brief but yet practical as I uh, can today. We'll get through this together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together and go through your word. Lord, today we're going to go through uh, creation, and Lord, as well, the nature of humanity. So may you be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last, well, I was it Thursday night. I was hungry, and I wanted to make a stew. So I went to the store in the afternoon. I got all the veggies. I got the sweet potatoes, the carrots, the frozen peas, and all these other mishmash of ingredients. And I started to cut them up, and I could already tell it was going to be good. And I got the seasonings, I got the tomato paste, and there was tomato puree, and I mashed it all together. And as I was doing this, I could tell that I wasn't feeling well. And so much so that by a half hour later, as I had put everything in a bowl and started to mash it up. I put it in the instant pot. I realized I am not feeling good at all. Turned the instant pot on and cleaned everything up and I literally felt like I was about to pass out. And it's been a long time since I felt that sick. And I felt bad because Lisa had gotten home shortly beforehand from work and she wanted to eat dinner. As soon as everything was done, I turned the instant pot on. I fell on the couch and went, ah. It was, I could sleep. So I slept for an hour, and I, roughly about an hour and a half. And I woke up with this horrible feeling of just that it overwhelmed me. I was sick, I was thirsty, I was tired. And then I realized, oh, I have the stew. Eh, I'll let it sit. So I let it sit another hour and a half. And finally I woke up and realized the soup was not gonna get put in the, in the containers for me to be able to eat for the rest of the week. So I got up, and by this time, it, again, I was feeling nauseous and, and uh, my head was hurting. But as soon as I opened up the pot, oh, it was so good. <laughs> And now I know I'm making some of you hungry. Don't worry. I'm trying to get through this. We're going to get out a little earlier than expected, so don't worry. I could smell, and it was tasty. And I started ladling the stew into containers so that I could eat them for the rest of the week. And I just realized, you know what, maybe I, I need to eat something. So I got a small bowl, and I put it in. And then I realized prior experience, the last five times, I've always burned myself. So I got a piece of ice. I got some ice and I put it in there and I, I stirred it around and I brought it and I carefully, carefully took a bite. It was so good. And I realized it is good. When we look at the creation account, we find God who designed this whole universe. In fact, it says God has revealed in scripture, primarily Genesis, but other areas such as the Psalms. God has revealed in scripture the authentic and historical account of his creative activity. He created the universe and in a recent six day creation, the Lord made the heavens, the earth and the sea and all that is in them and then rested on the Sabbath, seventh day. Thus he established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of, his, of the work he performed to complete it during the six literal days that together 
with the Sabbath constituted the same unit of time that we call a week today. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crowning work of creation, given dominion over the world and charged with the responsibility to care for the world. When, and when it was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of the Lord. So that's kind of just a capstone as far as the belief of creation. Now, when we look at creation, especially in Genesis, we find in the beginning, not some time, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And this was earth at its barest, 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 bare bones. And some ask, well, how did God create the heavens and the earth? And the Psalms, you know, as I read the Psalms this past year, I realized that there is a lot of references to creation. So for instance, just in chapter 33, verse 6, it says, by the what? <coughs> by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke as well in verse 9. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. So the very voice and spoken word of God. And as we remember, we talked a lot uh, about the Trinity last, uh, last week. We talked about the Father and the Son who essentially, if we also look in John... He, Father had the designs, the Son spoke it, and, I, and then the Holy Spirit as well carried it out. Trinity, the A, working as one, is how our earth came to be. Now, we could also read, but that's going to take too long, so I'm going to give you the highlights. Day one, God creates light. He separated light from the darkness. Okay, and it was good. Day two, he created an expanse. He created the skies, and it was very good. Day three, he separated the waters from the dry ground. And we also find that vegetation was also created, the plants, the trees. <coughs> Excuse me. Day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day five. This was my favorite day because God created the marine life and winged birds. I loved the ocean. I love water. Day six, <coughs> excuse me, created the livestock, creatures on the ground, and he also created Adam and Eve. And then finally, after a whole week, on the seventh day, God rested as a memorial for creation. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a story told as well of a father who, when he visited his son's preschool, it was a, a time where parents could come in and look at all the artwork that all of the kids had created. And so as this father was looking around, he was trying to find his son's artwork. And as he looked through all the various little portraits, he saw one in particular, and he realized, this has to be my son's Back to business. So the son, he sees his son's artwork, and he realizes, I think I have enough water. He sees his son's artwork, because with his son's artwork, he always left a sticker. And the sticker could be a sticker of a spider, maybe a lion, maybe a bug. <coughs> But it was his thing. And when he saw, he looked up, and he saw his son, and he said, is this yours? And he said, yep. It's so great. And the son, of course, said, I know. But the sticker, whatever he had written and drawn, <coughs> the sticker was a capstone. And in many respects, when we look at creation, not only do we see that life, man, woman, was the capstone, the sticker, and as well, the Sabbath as a memorial for creation. 
Now, we might ask as well, what, what's the purpose and the significance of creation? Well, number one was to reveal God's glory. You know, when, when you maybe move into a, a new place or you buy a home, you rent, whatever, you have to put stuff in it, such as a bed, a couch, items you're going to cook with. And you can have a very simple and very, very basic home. But most people are not like that. They want to make their home their own. And so what do they do? Maybe they'll put up an art, uh, uh, a painting. Maybe they'll do the floors a certain way. <coughs> Excuse me. And so they choose how they want to decorate their homes. And the earth, God didn't want just a plain earth. He built mountains. He created mountains. He created trees. He created rivers. He created the ocean. He created all of these beautiful things that reveal the creativity and the handiwork of God. And yet we also find that creation, significance of creation as well as obviously to populate the earth. Adam and Eve, plus eventually what would be their kids, and then also the animals. It was designed to be able to build up, populate the earth. So there's a lot of things, significance to creation. One of the biggest, of course, is the Sabbath. I thank God for Sabbath. Amen? Amen? I thank God that in God's wisdom created a day for us just to be able to stop. I'm not going to lie, though. As a, as a pastor, I have been... What am I doing? Thank you. You know, one thing I love about this church, they're always... Always looking out for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> oh boy. I can't. <laughs> I just realized if I chew, you're going to hear it too. <laughs> All right. It's just going to sit in the left side of my tongue. All right. So within the Sabbath, we find Sabbath. And we find that God gives us this gift of a day of rest. A time where we can just stop, relax, and be together with God and be with our families. And more often than not, especially the older I get, the more I realize that with such a busy lifestyle, and especially here in America, the world needs Sabbath even more. So, as, sorry, as a pastor, I was getting to this point. I have not always kept the Sabbath very well, especially as a pastor. Whether it's being that, oh, I'm, I'm trying to do last-minute study prep, or I'm just in meetings all day. Frankly, to be honest, Sabbath at many times in ministry was not a joy. Sometimes it was a burden because I felt like I just had to do stuff, stuff, stuff. <coughs> That's just a moment of transparency. But when we find, that when we truly do practice Sabbath, we find that there is a balance that, that comes to the fore. That when we stop at least for one day a week, and we just rest, there is so much more productivity that can come about. And not only that, your relationships are better. Your life is better. Rest is a necessary part of life. And as well as the capstone, as a cherry on top, it's a reminder as well of where we have come from, that God has created the heavens and the earth. And as well, creation, it, it, it reminds us of our true self-worth because God, we are made in the image of God. We come from God. Amen? Amen. Our basis is not in ourselves or on others, but in God. And where do we come from? God. It's also the basis for true fellowship because Adam, Adam didn't just stay by his own. He had a wife, a partner for life. We were built for relationships. And yet as well, creation is also a model for the fact that we're also stewards and we're responsible for the, earth, for the environment. And it's also... In, in many respects, when you look at God gives Adam 
the task of caring for and tending, especially the garden, dignity of manual labor. Have you ever worked outside and you just worked so hard, but at the end of the day, you felt good? Maybe not all of you. Only a handful of you said yes. But when you've done an honest, good, hard day's work, there's one of those few th there's a rare sense of accomplishment. So there's a lot of things that we could take. These are just a handful of things. And then ultimately as well, significance is the sacredness of life. Because we were designed and created by God, it is a sacred thing. We're not, well, we are, cons we are special in the eyes of the Lord because we are God's creation. And yet as well, when we, when we look at creation, sometimes we ask, well, God, why, why did you take six days when you could have just said it and all be done at once? Well, maybe he wanted to enjoy the time. I, I don't know. But ultimately, six days, when you think about how long does it take to build a house, quite a while. And God creates the heavens and the earth and everything, all that's in it. In six days, grand scheme of things, it's pretty short. But yet we also find too is that in creation and salvation is there's a sense of creativity. And when we think of even music or we think of painting or when we think of uh, building, however you want to be creative, that is also an innate uh, task or an innate gift that God has given to us. So be creative, whether it's writing, music, whatever it may be. That's also imprinted in our very own DNA. The next part. So when we talk about the nature of humanity, it says man and woman were made in the image of God with individuality, the power and freedom to think and to do. Though created free beings, each is an indivisible unit of body, mind, and spirit dependent upon God for life and breath and all else. When our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon him and fell into their high position. Fell from their high position. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. Their descendants share this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weakness and tendencies to evil. But God in Christ reconciled the world to himself and by his spirit restores impenitent mortals the image of their maker. Created for the glory of God, they are called to love him and one another and to care for their environment. So at the end of the day, well, what, actually not at the end of the day. When we look back, now I kind of just, I very, very uh, quickly overwent creation. But to focus especially on the sixth day, because on the sixth day, God creates humanity, Adam and Eve. And we find... Uh, in Genesis 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So humanity formed with dust and the nefesh, the soul, God breathed into Adam. Interestingly enough, when we die, where do we normally go? Into the ground. Humanity made in the image of God, was the capstone, the crowning achievement. And the beautiful thing that God did was, well, God, in a sense, gave us the ability, however, to choose and make decisions. <coughs> so with that, though, in some ways, was a risk because you give an opportunity to think, so give somebody a person to, a, to think, they're going to want to make their own decisions. God could have made Adam and Eve like robots and tell them to worship God, but is that true love? No. All right? Can you imagine? You want kids, but instead of having kids, you make robots and you tell them to love you? It's kind of weird, right? Yet... A true love, a loving relationship gives the opportunity for the other person to be able to think and to make their own decisions. 
And we find that God gives Adam and Eve that ability. And we find as well in Genesis 3 that while things were good, eventually we find that there's a serpent who was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you, will, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And then the serpent rep responds, you will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in the history of mankind, Eve is presented with a situation where the serpent misinforms her that, hey, she's going to die. It's just a matter of when. Not right away, but eventually she will die. And yet the serpent also gives her one tidbit that if you lie to her and says, if you eat this, you will be like God. But then to know good and evil. And when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleased to die, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. <laughs> she also gave some to her husband who was with her, who was with her, and ate it. You know, growing up, I was always told Eve ate the fruit and then she went to Adam. Guess what? Homeboy was with her the whole time. Ooh! Uh-oh. And he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were what? <gasps> they were naked. Because prior to that, they didn't even know. They were just Adam and Eve. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden because they regularly communed with God. And remember, we were created for relationships. We were created for community. And it was always common practice that they would get together. And now, for the first time in their lives, they realized that they were naked. They covered themselves up. And then they hid from God, their very own creator. And he says, where, God says, where are you? And Adam responds, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God responds with, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the true fruit that I commanded you? And here it is, it sets off a, what do you call it? I don't want to call it an avalanche, but a series of, <laughs> I don't want to call it unfortunate events either. <laughs> But we see that life will never be the same for Adam and Eve because knowledge of good and evil is now in their heads. And we see that because of the effects of that, there are consequences to their actions. Ultimately, we find that Adam and Eve will have to leave the beautiful Garden of Eden and to till the land, to care for it. Whereas they were already doing that, but now they have to work even harder. And as well, we find that <coughs> uh, in verse 17, chapter 3, it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and dust you will return. And we find that Adam and Eve, they make a mistake. And here that we find it in the very nature, they now 
have changed because they have the ability to know what is good and what is bad. But at this point, is hope lost? Hope is not lost. Because we actually find in verse 15, it says, and I will put enmity, this is talking to you about the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Ultimately, talking about what? Jesus. So, even in the garden, even at that time, God is faithful. And God provides hope. And God provides a solution. And even when we try to right the wrongs, there are also still consequences to our actions sometimes. And to do the right thing means that sometimes it's also painful. But God is gracious. God loves us. And God provides a solution. So we find that despite the dire outlook, there was hope. Now after all has been said and done, when we look at creation, when we look at the nature of humanity, there are questions that we could ask ourselves. When we look at creation, we're given the task and the responsibility to be able to care for this earth, for instance. How could we be better stewards of God's creation? Well, we could care for, make sure, well, okay, for instance, how many years was California in a drought? Six, seven. Six, seven. And that was just the most recent drought, right? California has suffered from drought for many, many years. We can be good managers of the water that we use, consume. We could recycle, we could do this, we could do that. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to go sciency on you. And I'm not going to tell you to do this or that. But when we look at Earth, man, Earth is dying. Can you all agree with me on that? Okay, and, and I think sometimes, even as Adventists, we have this cop-out that, well, Jesus is going to return, you know, really soon, so why, why do I have to bother? Because at the very beginning, God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility to tend and care for the earth. And that responsibility does not get negated from us. And as well, we can do things to help and do our part. Now, I wouldn't say you could go on social media and say you can do this and you do that, but ultimately, it's almost like we're just crying voices. At the end of the day, we can start with us and we can start in our home and set a good example. And by your influence and the people around, we can make a better effect for change. You know, Um, you look at Australia right now. How many koalas have died? How many other kangaroos? How many of you have seen the pictures? It's been a long time, a couple of months, <laughs> that I, I broke down in tears of seeing something that hurt my heart, and there was nothing I could do. But we see the effects of this earth where it's on a crash course. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm, not, I'm, tr I'm trying to bring a practical solution. I'm not going to speak for this or that because honestly, I don't know and I don't have the solutions. But what I, I do know is I can be responsible for how uh, much water I use and the times and whatnot and responsibility that I can do and affect positive change. Over half a million, if not possibly a billion animals have died just in Australia alone in the last however long. Being stewards of your resources is important. God asks us to take care of it. So be responsible in your own home and in your own life. And then be, and may, your, may your actions and your testimony reflect to others that they may learn and we can all be responsible. 
And then the last question I want to ask, bridging the gap. Kind of went through this. How can we, I didn't have it here. How do we view others? We're all created in the image of God. When I look at my brother, my fellow brother, my fellow sister, and I get angry at them, and I get upset, how do we normally view them? Well, they did something, so I'm going to get even with them. I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. We sometimes fail that in our, even in our own anger and frustration, we realize that they are just as much a child of God. And that we're all, at the end of the day, we're all sinners saved by God. And the creation account reminds me as well of how we should treat our fellow brothers and sisters with dignity, with grace, with love, and with forgiveness. We're all brothers and sisters in one big family. Would God not want us as well to be able to treat each other as such? So may we love well. May we love as if everyone was your brother and sister. And may we be understanding and, and rather than jump to conclusions, start with a civil conversation and be able to hear from one another. And may we as well take hope in the fact that God has overcome the world. And as we talk about the experience of salvation in the next couple of weeks, may we seek to know a God who loves us and has redeemed us. And that by their faith may be strengthened and hope secured. Father in heaven, Lord, be with us today as we go forth. Lord, you have created this earth. You have created the foundation. And as well, Lord, we pray that you will help us to have, help us to wisely use the resources that, Lord, you have blessed us with. God, as well, may we be loving. May we be kind. May we, as well, love one another as if everyone is our brother and sister. Because ultimately in you, they are. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, that you've saved and died for us. And Lord, as well, as we go forth this next week, continue to give us opportunities to minister and to share you with others through our testimonies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.